Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Demkovic. Um, I wanted to give you a very brief uh, introduction to this summer school before we get started. Um, first of all, just uh, two very brief preliminaries. I have been going through and muting everybody who does not automatically mute themselves. Um, so I think I've gotten everybody. But if you are not the speaker and you are still not muted, I would be very grateful if you would just go ahead and mute yourself to make sure that we don't get any background noise going on uh, during the talk. I also wanted to um, point out to you um, that this uh, talk, as well as all the subsequent talks in this summer school, will be recorded um, with the purpose of posting it later on a uh, private YouTube channel. So I'll send all of you the link to that channel later once we post this uh, recording. But in any case, if you have objections to being recorded, um, I just wanted to give you fair warning. You have two options. You can either sign off and um, view the recording of this uh, lecture later uh, asynchronously, or if you prefer, uh, you can mute your camera, mute your um, your microphone, um, so that you know nobody sees you. If if that's better, um, but in any, in any case, I wanted to give you fair warning about that. Okay, I also uh, I wanted to uh, give you just a very brief uh, introduction to the um, to CREDS, the Center for Research Excellence on Dynamically Deformed Solids, which is an NNSA funded uh, academic project. It's a it's a center. Uh, that is led by Texas A&M University. Um, this is the center that you know um, went went ahead and organized this uh, summer school. Um, we are actually going to organize. You know, we were sort of on the hook for organizing this summer school in two years uh, in uh, in person, but we figured what better time to organize a remote one than now. So so there you have it. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge, of course, the fact that Creds is an NNSA funded. Uh, center, so you can see the acknowledgement here, as well as with the necessary disclaimer that we only represent our own views, not the NSA's views. The summer school syllabus um, is uh, something that I hope that you've all received already. This is just a uh, you know just a reminder. Uh, the first session, today's session, is an intro session, um, and then starting next week, so the the lectures will be weekly, always at this time. Uh, starting next week, we will also have review sessions, which will occur on Thursdays, one hour earlier than the lectures. Um, so those will be basically opportunities to go over some uh, review problems that will be given to you so that you can uh, reinforce concepts. I wanted to give you some stats on the people who have registered uh, for this. So these stats are as of yesterday evening, so they've actually changed a little bit already. I, I typically get you know a half dozen or so people registering every day still. So, um, but in any case, we have something like 130 something registrants, probably closer to 140 or 150 at this point. And uh, I see that we have 113 uh, people signed on right now. So quite a few. Um, of those, I would say about a third are sponsored by NNSA academic projects. So welcome all of you. Uh, and the rest are not, so which is completely fine. Um, and uh, and everybody is, of course, uh, welcome to attend here. We're only limited by uh, the capacity that that WebEx has, and, and we're not close to that yet. My institution, in, in case you're interested, uh, the, we have the largest number of registrants from Texas A&M University, not surprisingly, since this is the lead university at CREDS. Um, second largest, Johns Hopkins with 16. Then we've got University of Michigan with eight. Uh, Lawrence Livermore with six, and then we have five each from Notre Dame, from Slack, UCSB, UC Berkeley, as well as from industry, Baker Hughes. Four registrants from UC San Diego, Oklahoma State University, University of Connecticut. Three from University of Nevada, Reno, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, University of Buffalo, and of Rochester. Uh, two from Washington State University, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Stony Brook, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And then one each from University of New Mexico, uh, the National High Magnetic Field Lab at, at Florida State, Purdue, Georgia Tech, University of Kentucky, Rice, Los Alamos, Case Western, one international participant from the University of Milan, welcome, uh, 
uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst and University of South Florida. Um, yesterday, or not yesterday, but uh, two weeks ago or so, I first announced um, the summer school. Uh, I asked you to fill out a, uh, a, um, a survey just so the, the lecturers have a little bit of an idea of where you're all coming from. Uh, this is the data from the survey. I'm not going to go through everything. Uh, you can always go back to the review to the uh, recorded version of this and, and look through this in detail later. But two things that I wanted to point out, a couple of things that I wanted to point out, which I found interesting. Uh, some people here, their highest uh, completed degree is high school, which means that they're undergraduates. So we have a, a number of undergraduates here. Welcome. We also have a number of people who have completed their PhDs, which means that they've transitioned to be to being postdocs or technical staff. So, you know, professionals. Uh, so we're not just talking to grad students here. We're also talking to undergrads and professionals. Um, uh, in terms of background, a lot of you have backgrounds in material science, physics, mechanics of solids, um, you know, all of which is sort of to be expected, I would say. Uh, you also learn a little bit here about uh, where everybody heard about um, this, uh, this announcement. And then I also found it interesting that if you look at the motivation that people had for taking this course, the, the greatest motivation is personal interest. And the second highest motivation is interest in the lectures which I think is awesome. Um, I uh, wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of the people who agreed to lecture uh, in this summer school. None of them are being uh, paid for it. This is all entirely voluntary. So we thank you very much. And as you can see, uh, you are a big part of the draw for this summer school. Not only your lecture, but your, your very person uh, is, uh, is of interest to the participants. So thank you very much for that. And, and we certainly think that this is gonna be an outstanding summer school on account of the very high caliber of lecturers that we have um, uh, who have agreed to, to, to give lectures. Um, we also received a few comments and, and I'm doing a, a quick summary here of some of the you know, more specific comments. Uh, these are very useful. Thank you for sharing them with us. Uh, they've been passed to the lectures. So you know, this is something that we're gonna take into account as we design the lectures. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. And so now without further ado, um, I wanted to uh, introduce today's lecture. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. KT Ramesh is a professor in the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. He got his PhD from Brown University in 1987. He is in fact the director of the Hopkins Extreme Materials in Institute, which, uh, whose bread and butter are these kinds of dynamic deformation of solids issues. So uh, we're very happy to have him give us the introductory lecture. Um, he has received numerous awards, but I just wanted to um, highlight the Murray Medal in, in 2015 from the uh, Society of Experimental Mechanics, which recognizes his lifelong contribution to uh, the field of, of dynamic deformation testing. Um, Professor Ramesh has, according to Google as of yesterday, 512 publications uh, with an H factor of 64. I found it interesting that both are powers of two um, and then nearly 15,000 citations, and I don't believe that that one is a power of two. But uh, we're very happy to have you here. Um, I would just ask everybody in the interest, since there's so many of us, in the interest of, uh, of time, let's please hold our questions uh, until the end of the lecture, and uh, we will then uh, have uh, a question and answer session at the end of the, of the lecture. So Professor Ramesh, welcome. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I will mute myself and stop sharing the slides and you can share your slides and we'll proceed with the, with your, with the talk. Great. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Michael. Can you guys hear me? <clears throat> can you hear me? We can hear you, or at least I can hear you. Thank you. All right. Now, what I need to do is figure out how to share. Do you need to make me post or something so I can show? Nope. You should be able to simply hover on the bottom of your uh, WebEx screen, and there should be a button there, uh, an up arrow from pointing up from a from a little rectangle. Oh, I, I, need to, I need to set something in my. Uh -oh. Okay, that's good. Okay, I can share. 
And you should be seeing a screen now. Yes, I see it. Very good. Okay. Uh, so um, thank you all for joining me. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Um, never thought in terms of powers of two. And uh, I, I'm always interested in how Google obtains its data. So this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but uh, I'm going to um, talk very generally today. Um, I was given uh, essentially the generic task of talking about deformations in nature and in technology. Um, and I'm going to try to be fairly broad. Um, actually, I hadn't realized until you said it just now, Michael, that um, we have a number of students here who are undergraduates. I should have looked a little more carefully at the survey. Um, I think I'm pitching this right, though. Let, let's, let's hope it works, comes uh, across easily. Uh, I know for some of you, uh, I, I was just looking at the participant list. Uh, for some of you uh, on the participant list, this is going to be a little uh, trivial. Uh, but I still hope you find it interesting. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about a, a range of things. Yeah, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the school is really worthwhile, that the kinds of things you're studying here are going to be valuable to you, and uh, not just in terms of your work, uh, but in terms of your lives. Uh, so I have a bunch of pictures up on the top. Uh, let me see if there's a way I can minimize this thing. I guess not. Move it down here. Yeah. Um, so I've got a, a bunch of pictures on the top. One of them is actually a movie. So let me go ahead and try to get that started. Um, so what we have on the left is an image of the an image of the brain. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a little while. Um, the second picture is that of a woodpecker. That's still a brain problem, but also a structural problem, as you can imagine. Uh, you have an impact dynamics question there. Uh, the third picture in, let's see, can you guys see my, my cursor? Michael, can you see the cursor? I do not see the cursor right now. We can see it moving. You can, okay. All right. So I'm now pointing at the moon, and down towards the bottom of the moon, you'll see a relatively bright crater which has rays moving out from it. That crater is called Tycho. Um, actually, everything that you see on the moon here, uh, this is the signature of impact, major impacts on the moon. This is a picture taken by a friend of mine, uh, actually from a couple of miles uh, from my house uh, on May 2nd uh, of um, the Gibbous moon. Uh, these dark areas are very large impacts. Um, you have a dark material coming out. You can see brighter regions, which are kind of older. Um, and then you can see the individual craters in here, and we want to talk about that. And then off on the right here is a movie made by a graduate student of mine, Gary Simpson, uh, which shows you a number of things. So you have an impact onto, in this case, a piece of uh, polymethyl methacrylate, the PMMA. Um, the impact generates waves. You can see the wave propagate. You can see spall develop. So these are the kinds of things that are interesting. Lots of different things happening at one time. Uh, that movie on the right is taken at a um, few million frames per second. All right. I'm going to start by trying to convince you that this is a really big picture question. So this is a picture taken from the Hubble telescope of the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant. So you can see this with your a uh, little baby telescope with a pair of binoculars, so a little tricky, kind of a gray blob. Uh, but when you get to look at it with something like Hubble, you begin to see it's got structure. This is actually the result of a massive explosion. Uh, and if you look further out, you'll actually see shockwaves coming off this uh, structure. So these are very large scale events. To get a little smaller, uh, this picture on the top is again a photograph of Tycho, the crater I showed you a minute ago on the moon. Oh, and you can see it's got a central peak here, a um, little mountain in the middle of the crater. This thing is now tens of kilometers across. And of course, you can see things, uh, these dynamic events that we generate on Earth, uh, a nuclear explosion. So this is actually from the website of ready.gov, which uh, is supposed to help us uh, with respect to these kinds of events. Um, on the bottom left, here is a picture from Kobe after the great Kobe earthquake in Japan. You can see how some of the buildings have pancaked. Uh, 
Earthquakes are a great example of large-scale dynamic events. Uh, lots of stored energy that you release suddenly, and then that process is a very uh, nice example of a lot of the things we're going to discuss during this course. Um, and then something that you may not be as familiar with, but uh, as you get older, you are much more likely to fall. That fall is also a dynamic event. Of course, there are the consequences on your brain, uh, but there are also the consequences on the rest of your, your body, which is kind of an interesting uh, area to think about uh, and relates to how stiff you get uh, as you get older. And then finally, of course, we have things like sports where you deliberately uh, impact somebody else. Well, we're not going to talk too much about that uh, during this hour or so that I have. All right, so lots of real dynamic events in nature. You can also get to see these in engineering, in technological areas. So uh, here is an example of an impact onto a large slab of aluminum. Um, this is a picture taken by the European Space Agency, a relatively high velocity impact, seven kilometers per second or so. Um, but you can see very similar things if you generate a large laser pulse and use that laser pulse to generate uh, a scab or a spall, piece of material coming off. Uh, this is now in the micron scale. You can use this kind of technology, right? So we use it for or what's called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Uh, essentially, you, you create shockwaves, you focus those shockwaves, you use them to break up kidney stones. Um, it's a very well developed technology now, and since the uh, mid 1990s or so, is something that uh, you can find routinely in uh, various clinical operations. And of course, you can get um, bullets impacting things. Uh, this would be the kind of thing that I might be interested in. Uh, you can get blast and explosions. Um, you can get them in combat. You can get them in mining. Uh, all of those are interesting um, places to look. And of course, we get large scale impacts when we have things like car crashes and aircraft crashes. So everything on this screen is an engineering application, sometimes intended, sometimes not, of dynamics. So all of these are examples of dynamics. And I want to try to classify things a little bit so that you, you have a way of thinking about this. Um, I'll give you three more examples. So here's the woodpecker again. Uh, just imagine how much damage the woodpecker is doing to the wood, literally creating large holes in the wood while managing to uh, not just survive, but to do very well for itself. Now, we try to do similar things. Uh, this is heading in soccer. We certainly don't subject ourselves to as much of an impact as the woodpecker does. Uh, and yet, uh, in soccer, you do occasionally get a kind of blindness that sets in uh, for some small fraction, but a significant fraction uh, of individuals. You get uh, blindness in one eye as a consequence of heading in certain ways. Um, that's a, an injury called indirect traumatic optic neuropathy, and it's essentially an impact on a dynamics problem. And maybe at the smaller scale for you to think about, this is a blastocyst. This is the very early stages of the formation of a human embryo. So you start with a single cell, right? The, well, the single egg, it gets fertilized. Uh, now you have a, uh, the, the uh, embryo itself is beginning to grow. You get the single cell that multiplies, keeps multiplying. Eventually it forms a, this little spherical ball called the blastocyst. The point about this, this is a large collection of cells, but it is fundamentally spherical. You, in contrast, are fundamentally not spherical, I hope. Uh, you typically have bilateral symmetry. Actually, by definition, if you're listening to me, you have bilateral symmetry. Um, and the question is, how does this spherical structure become this bilaterally symmetric structure? And that process, it turns out, is essentially an instability, which is very much like a fracture process. And that splitting is what generates the bilateral structure that now you have. So uh, these uh, mechanisms that we're thinking about in terms of the dynamics, the instability, the extreme conditions associated with them, these all manifest themselves at a very large range of scales. So I want to take some time to really talk about what we mean by dynamic, and I'm going to try to set the stage for the rest of the class here, yeah? or the rest of the course. So there are three different things that we tend to say when we say dynamic in this kind of setting. So one is what you're seeing here in this picture idea of waves that propagate in the system. So this is the case of impact onto glass. 
you have an impact, you can see the waves begin to spread out. And when you say dynamic, you mean you're going to track the waves and those waves are important to you. That's one kind of dynamics. However, there's another kind where the waves are no longer relevant to you. The waves have gone by. At a slightly later time though, you begin to get high rate deformation. So this is high strain rate deformation, but you don't need to worry about the wave propagation. This is also what we would call dynamics. And some people would say these are dynamically deforming solids. So two different kinds of dynamics, very short time scales, wave propagation really counts, slightly larger time scales, slightly larger length scales. You have a level of uniformity of the stress state and now you have high rate deformation. And then there's a third sense in which one thinks about dynamics. And this is the sense of inertia, not inertia that generates wave propagation, but the idea that you have some kind of a mechanism inside your system a propagating crack, a growing void, a propagating twin, and the rate at which that crack grows is, has an effective inertia associated with it. If you try to drive the crack too fast, it's as though the crack has more mass. Okay? All these three are what we would call dynamics, but they are three different kinds of dynamics. Wave propagation, high rate deformation, and essentially micro inertia of some sort associated with the mechanism. All three of these kinds of dynamics are going to be talked about in this class. I'm structuring, listing your topics in the class here and putting them into these bins. So the colors on the left, so the propagation dominated things are in blue. The high rate propagation things, or high rate deformation things are in red and the mechanism things are in green. And you can look at your class structure and you can see our classes are sort of divided up in this way into the kinds of things you're going to be thinking about. We naturally tend to do this. Some of us in the, in the field tend to fit in one place or the other with respect to those three, but all of us are talking about dynamics in one of these three contexts. Okay. Now, we should recognize where these kinds of dynamics come from. And they really come from two different kinds of sources. They come from extreme events like the big impact or the big explosion, that kind of thing. A lot of us tend to think in those terms. You do the impact experiment, you generate the explosion, uh, and, and you're interested in what happens as a consequence. That's an extreme event. But there's another kind of place where the dynamic shows up, and that's where you have an instability. Something that's initially uniform, relatively slow, everything is happening in a, a nice way, that is everything, all the gradients are small, and then the system becomes unstable. And when the system becomes unstable, the instability results in a release of energy or a propagating wave of some sort. And the picture I have for you on the right is that of a collapsing bubble in a fluid. The bubble collapses. Now we're doing it at 10 million frames per second. Now you get a shock wave. Okay, so. But the bubble collapsing is very slow. You put a big bubble, so you hit very, get very high temperature in the middle of the bubble. I'm going to run this again, I hope. Let's see, will it run again? Maybe I didn't loop it. Here we go. So it's a large bubble, 200,000 frames per second. Now you shrink it. Now you start going much faster at 10,000 frames per second. The bubble keeps collapsing and now you've got the shock wave. So what happens is the bubble was spherically symmetric. As it collapses, it generates a jet and that collapse process generates a shock wave. So you've got dynamics both from the extreme event and the instability. You've got to think about both of those. All right, with that in mind, I'm going to do something that with luck will help you down the line. I'm going to give you a way of thinking about all of the experiments that people typically in do in dynamics. And we'll talk about modeling later. But so if I take all of the impact shock and high strain rate experiments you typically think about, you can classify them in many ways. But here's one way of classifying them. You can classify them in terms of experiments that are wave dominated or materials dominated. Essentially, the wave matters or it's more the material behavior that matters. Okay? So this is more like the waves and the high strain rates. On the wave dominated end, you see all these things on the left, the shock loading, laser shock, plate impact of various types. Uh, high speed visualization is really often for wave dominated problems, spallation, dynamic fracture, blast. Materials dominated on the right, you see shear band experiments, perforation, penetration, impact cratering, ballistics, um, and then you have some other techniques. So all of the, these can be categorized in these two ways. 
So depending on how you think about the problem, you can design your experiment and your model differently, or what information you can extract from your model is different. So this kind of taxonomy is kind of useful when you're deciding how you want to approach a problem. With that background, let's start thinking about some real applications. So let's start with the very big picture, with nature. So at a very large scale, when you think about planet-scale events, uh, this is actually just looking at the biota uh, on the world, uh, in the world, just looking at the growth of the biota, where that is. So this is a NASA uh, visualization. Um, you can see it's a very, very large scale. So this is a bow shock, uh, another picture from Hubble uh, of a star. Uh, this is actually a star somewhere in Orion. Uh, and you, so you can see shock waves, right, at very, very large scales. This is now light years uh, in scale. Um, so very large scales, you see dynamics. And you can see them at very small scales that are manifested at very large scales. So this is, uh, first of all, this looks like a picture of the Milky Way, and it is. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is the bottom of this picture. You see this bright region. This is the zodiacal light. It's a region of the sky that shows up bright when you look at it. And it's typically on the side opposite from the sun, away from the sun. It really is what is sometimes called the false dawn. And this was actually the poem that I have up on the top left. Uh, this is from Omar Khayyam, one of my favorite poems. This is Drubayat. And he says, dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky, Dawn's left hand is the false dawn, the zodiacal light. I heard a voice within the tavern cry, awake my little ones and fill the cup before life's liquor and its cup be dry. So this is shown just before the dawn. That's where you see it. Now this light that you're seeing, the zodiacal light, is that the sunlight reflecting of dust in the solar system. And you might ask, where does the dynamics come in? All of that dust, on the false dawn of dust, was generated by impacts. Those impacts generated these small scale fragments that go out into the system, populate the system, and you can see them with the naked eye because the sun, sunlight reflects off them. This is a picture by Chris Beale taken in Namibia a few months ago. Okay. So let's look at populations in the solar system. These are asteroids, these are asteroidal orbits in the solar system. Uh, and I'm coloring these asteroid orbits by the brightness of the asteroid. So the color scale is the albedo, the brightness of the surface. If it's dark blue, then it's a very dark asteroid. If it's bright green, it's a relatively bright asteroid. Relatively bright meaning it reflects 30% of the light it gets. <clears throat> Essentially, this color scale is telling you about the materials of the surface of the asteroid. Incidentally, the purple thing that you see there is Mars. The uh, light green thing or bluish thing on the extreme left, bottom left, that's Jupiter. The blue thing towards the middle is the Earth, and the yellow thing, of course, is the Sun. So these are the main belt asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. And you'll see that there are lots of stony asteroids. There are lots of rocky asteroids, a few metallic asteroids. The composition tells you what the age of the asteroid is, how much processing, uh, meaning uh, how, uh, how much it has evolved over the time. And it, its time in the solar system. So this is the kind of material that we have out there. These asteroids are typically a consequence of impact. So you've got large-scale events. So we go look at the solar system, and this is what we see. Everywhere we look, if we can see a rocky body, we see craters. So this is Mercury. This is from the NASA Messenger mission. You see very large-scale craters. In this case, you have actually essentially an impact basin. So here's a ring of mountains on the outside a second ring of mountains on the inside, and then craters within them. And out here on the left, you can see large craters with collapsed walls across. This is Mercury, very close to the sun. Typical impact on Mercury occurs at about 50 kilometers per second. So body of a certain size is coming in at 50 kilometers per second on Mercury. Look at Mars, it's covered with craters too. You see a wide range of craters, lots of different sizes. Mars is a very thin atmosphere. Mercury has an extremely thin atmosphere. So lots of craters, nothing much to stop the meteorites coming in or the asteroids coming in, which is really how you get these craters. Oh, the colors here, by the way, mean the height above some mean level. And of course, you see them or not. This is Barringer Crater in Arizona. Um, so you can see 
reasonably large craters or not, this is in the range of a kilometer. So kilometers compared to hundreds of kilometers in Mercury. Um, so craters everywhere. There are actually craters on Venus, but Venus is so heavily processed, it's hard to see. And now let's go back to Tycho Crater on Earth's moon. This is a movie taken by the Kaguya and so mission on the, the Saline mission, the Kaguya camera, I believe. Uh, it was an HD camera that was carried across by the mission. And now you can build these nice three-dimensional renderings of what the central peak of the Tycho crater looks like. This crater, by the way, you can see if you look, go out tonight and look up, the bright, brightest crater you see on the moon, and you can see it with your naked eye, is this one. And this is what it looks like in the middle. That mountain is a couple of kilometers high, it's fairly tall. Uh, it's the consequence of the impact, the uplift in the middle of the crater uh, during the impact generates this mount. And then now we're moving off towards the edges. Uh, you'll see there's lots of dust, actually lots of gravel uh, inside this crater. Uh, now you move over to the, the rim of the crater and you see that the rim has begun to collapse, an indication of gravity. Significant gravity causes this rim collapse. You can see the collapse slope as it comes down. So you can see a lot about the geology and the geophysics and the properties of this uh, moon, of our moon, by looking at the craters, by looking at the structure. All right. And if you go look a little more carefully at the crater, at the, at the moon, this is what you see. This is not Tycho anymore. But the picture on the right, by the way, is from the Apollo 15 mission. So you can see their footprints. Their footprints are in soil. That soil we call regolith. The regolith, if you look at it on the left, it has a certain structure. So the top 10 meters or so are fairly dusty. Uh, then you go deeper down, you get large scale ejector, lots of broken pieces, eventually fractured crust. What you see on the surface of the moon is almost entirely impact detritus. So the debris from impacts is right across the moon. That's what you're seeing with the naked eye. That's what we hope to be able to, ex to exploit when we land on the moon um, and try to develop lunar bases there. So impact dynamics right across this domain. All these cracks that you're seeing here, most of them in this kind of an image, they would have been generated by large scale impact events. And of course, we ourselves as the Earth get hit by asteroids all the time. You remember the Chelyabinsk asteroid or uh, the event that was in Chelyabinsk in uh, the Soviet Union, in Russia, sorry. Um, in 2013 or so. Uh, here's a theater inside Chelyabinsk. Uh, you can see all the glass from the windows inside the theater, which tells you it's a shockwave that generated the glass. Okay, so dynamics all across the scale. You've taken kinetic energy from the asteroid, coupled it into the Earth, eventually into failure on the Earth's surface. If you look a little more carefully at the Chelyabinsk asteroid, you've got a piece of it on the top right. This is from the work of Popova in science. And pictures from the left, this is actually a simulation on the left that shows you, you had a meteoroid, an asteroid coming into the Earth. It breaks up in the atmosphere. When it breaks up, it generates those shock waves. One of those shock waves caused the damage we saw in the previous uh, structure, in the previous image. Uh, and if you look at the meteorite, meteorite itself, the piece that's left on the ground and go look at it, you'll see in the microstructure on the bottom right, shock veins. This thing has been shocked even before it hit the Earth. So it's seen shocks before it got here. You can also see on the surface of this meteoroid, this dark region, that is a thin region that was heated by its propagation through the atmosphere. It's extremely thin because you're coming into the Earth at about 20 kilometers per second. So an impact in, at, on Mercury is typically 50 kilometers per second. Around the Earth is 15 to 20 kilometers per second. So about the same for the Moon. At Mars is about seven kilometers per second, and the main belt of the asteroids like five kilometers per second. So those are the impact velocities that we get in the solar system in terms of nature. And of course, you can then do simulations of things like that. And you'll see if you have large scale impacts, you can generate fragments, you generate debris, you will throw off material, but it is large scale, which means gravity counts and the material is going to fall back onto your sap onto your asteroid. So it turns out to be actually pretty hard to break up an asteroid. Once it's broken up, it'll come back together because of gravity, but it'll be held together loosely 
we call these things rubble piles when they're held together loosely this way. Uh, in this movie, anything that's red has been fragmented. Uh, and we will, by the way, have a mission to impact an asteroid, which is launched, will be launched next year. It's called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. Uh, lots of people working on this, including some from Livermore. Um, and this particular mission is intended to do this. It's going to impact a binary asteroid, impact the moon, which is called Didymos B or Diddy Moon. And the idea is to change the orbit of the moon and to be able to measure the orbit of the moon of the primary asteroid using a telescope here. And then so we can measure how much change we get. All right, so this is going to be launched in July, uh, sorry, June next year. So that's nature. We see impacts at very large scales. Let's move to technology. So this is the car I drive. That's a relatively low velocity impact, 35 kilometers, I'm sorry, miles per hour. Uh, significant damage occurs uh, on the side. Um, the car is in pretty bad shape. Um, you would probably consider the car totaled at this point. But the good thing about it is the driver is likely to survive. And of course, that's the whole idea, right? You design the car to survive the impact. The car is designed not just to move you, but to take the damage so that you survive. And you can see how much damage is generated and all the various motions you're going to get uh, as a consequence of the impact event. So you might also generate impact deliberately. So this is um, an aluminum bead impacting a steel plate. And there's a small piece that you generate off on the left. Um, you can compute what's likely to happen in this case, and you can compute the thickness of the small plate and so forth. It's a really interesting problem to look at. Here's another example of dynamics. Here, wave propagation counts and the high rate deformations count and the failure mechanism counts. All three of those things we talked about in terms of dynamics matter in a problem like this. So here's one way of trying to capture all of this together. So when you look at your overall impact event, there are these domains that you're likely to see in the event. So right under the impact, oh, so think about this a line here, the thick line on the top as being length scale, moving far away from the impact. Right under the impact, you'll call it the source domain. You'll get entropic heating of various sorts. Thermal effects are really important. The equation of state matters. You might get vaporization. You might get plasma. Um, a little bit further away, your strong shocks matter. You might get liquids. You might get liquid liquids condensing to form fragments. Further away still, the shocks have died down, the strength matters more, the plasticity matters. You tend to see things like elastic plastic behavior, you get failure mechanisms like shear bands and voids and cracks. So you have to be sufficiently far away. So pressure is dropping off as you move away. So you have to be out here to get the cracks and the voids. And then much later, you get the crumpling and the tearing and that structural domains. So you can look at one of these impacts and you can see the impact is at one point but there's a range of behaviors as a consequence of the impact, a range of dynamics that you have to think about. You can compute the corresponding states you're likely to get, the pressures, the strain rates, the temperatures, you can calculate those out. You're going to learn all of that through the rest of this course, I'm sure. You can look at the specific failure mechanisms that will be developed during the event, and you can see how the time scales and the length scales are collected together. So these kinds of connections you can make. And of course, you can see these in real events. So this is a piece of concrete exploding. So initially, you're storing the energy statically, but when it fails, it fails dynamically. That's a dynamic fracture problem. So statically stored energy released dynamically. You can do this as Nestorenko and co did uh, in terms of collapsing cylinders. Now you see shear bands. These are collections of shear bands that form inside the cylinders. You can see there's a fragmentation scale there. Or you can do this in terms of voiding, and you'll see spallation. You'll see voids nucleating and growing. That will generate a spall failure process. So these are different kinds of failure mechanisms that you can get in the technological sense. And that wave propagation problem and your damage problem are cut. So here is the movie I showed you at the very beginning. You have the primary impact. This is at oh, three kilometers per second or so. See the waves go through, you actually see a shear wave if you look carefully. 
Well, you see the reflected waves, you see them interacting, and eventually you get damage, ejecto. This is how you count craters. And you can see these craters in metals too. So this was the crater that I showed in the aluminum after a seven kilometer per second shot. Here's a picture from James Walker, impact into 24, 24 aluminum at four kilometers per second. This is also a uh, both are aluminum now, and you see large craters, right? The craters have a different structure than in the uh, asteroidal case. Your scale is not big enough for gravity to matter, and your mechanisms are different because you've got ductility in the matter. And there's then the general question of how materials behave at high strain rates. Um, I'm realizing here I don't have enough time to run through all of this, but when you think about different kinds of materials, you're going to get different kinds of behavior. This is the high rate behavior problem. Uh, I don't have the time to walk through this. I'll leave the slides with you. But essentially, you choose the material of interest, let's say a metal. That will tell you what the deformation mechanism is. In metals, it's dislocations. If you choose a particular kind of metal, let's say an FCC metal like aluminum, face-centered cubic, that tells you how the dislocations change, how the dislocations move, and that will tell you what the material behavior is going to be. So people build models for this, and you can understand the material behavior that way. You can try to make the material stronger by adding solutes to it, to adding precipitates, or adding big inclusions, but you won't change the core behavior of the matrix. And so the rate dependent behavior is determined by what the aluminum structure. You just shift the baseline and add a small piece to the top of it. BCC metals are very different because the mechanism is different, how the locations move is different. So by understanding the material, you can say something about how failure occurs. If you're looking at ceramics, though, you don't worry about the dislocations as much. It's fracture that counts. Now it's things like crack speed, fracture toughness. That is inherently going to give you a size scale and rate dependence, the consequence of having those two. So if you look inside a ceramic, you see lots of defects. Those defects generate cracks. So you can see these cracks coming off here. There's the defect, this flat thing, and here are the cracks that come off. And you can look at multiple defects here, all connected by cracks. Okay, this is um, boron carbide, I believe. So, typical ceramic you look at is full of these kinds of defects. That's because they have to put something in there that helps consolidate the ceramic when you're making it. And the result is that you're going to get time scales in the problem because the cracks move at finite speeds. And so you get this kind of behavior. Um, and I'm going to take a few minutes to walk through this. So the top right of this quadrant of this plot is telling you how the defects in your material are distributed. There's some defect size distribution you have. The bottom right quadrant is telling you the stress it takes to activate a defect, to grow a crack from the defect. Typically, the bigger the defect, the smaller the stress. So you get this curve. The bottom left picture is giving you stress as a function of time. Low rate loading would be the red curve. High rate loading would be the green curve. For a given time, you'll see low rate loading will therefore initiate only the big defects. High rate loading will initiate more of the defects. So you'll get rate dependent behavior just because you've got a defect size distribution. It's as simple as that. Right? So the fact that you've got finite crack speeds gives you a limiting time scale. That then gives you this rate dependent behavior. And so defect distributions dominate ceramics. Metals, ceramics. You can think about all of these materials the same in some sense like this. All right. So that's technology. So wave propagation and high rate deformations. I'm going to spend my last few slides, my last few minutes on trying to couple these two together and looking at the influence of technology and nature together. We already talked about the kidney stone problem, lithotripsy. It's used for breaking things up. So basically shock waves that are focused, trying to break up stones. A uh, really interesting area for those of you who are uh, undergraduate and graduate students that you want to go off and do something. Uh, something that people really don't have a good understanding of is what determines the fracture toughness of these stones. Um, can you change the toughness of those stones by changing your diet? The answer seems to be yes. Uh, can you change how you de develop the shock waves so that you break up the stone more easily? I think people believe the answer is yes, but there's some controversy in that domain. You can use shock waves to get through the blood brain barrier and potentially provide drugs at the brain, because it's really hard to deliver drugs through the blood to the brain. The body is designed to prevent that. And of course, you can use shock waves to actually get viruses into cells. 
So you can use a shockwave, let's say by using a laser, to effectively open up the cell membrane, drive the virus through, and then the virus can lead to some kind of a multiplication process, some kind of bio uh, um, uh, replication to develop a specific protein inside the cell. And we use this all the time. These are applications of dynamics, applications of waves to biology at very small scales. And of course, we do this at much larger scales. This was in January this year. It quickly burst into flames with human inside. The nice part of the story is he not only survived, but three months later he was racing again. So, significant impact generated because you're moving at high speed in the first place, but a well designed structure that allowed the driver to survive. Hurt, but survive. And we also do other things. We call the sport. So every boxer understands something about shots and the likelihood that certain kinds of punches are more likely to knock someone out than others. And then, of course, we have things like missiles. Uh, this was the case of the Iranian attack on the base that we had in Iraq. Uh, and we, re we remember that the primary injury that resulted from that was really brain injury. We also get injuries from IEDs, improvised explosive devices, these are all couplings of technology into nature, into the human body, primarily. We build helmets to protect ourselves from those kinds of impacts. Okay. The point about this in terms of dynamics with respect to the human body, with respect to nature, is nature is fundamentally soft. If you take the brain as an example, our brains are fundamentally soft and very squishy and fairly fibrous. We have low stiffnesses, the shear stiffness is very low in the kilopascals, which means you have low wave speeds. The pressure stiffness, the compressibility, is actually quite low because the bulk stiffness is high. So the pressure wave speed, the bulk speed is high, kilometers per second. The shear speed is low, 10 meters per second. So you get an immediate separation of scales. You have an impact and you get a separation of scales. The pressure wave moves fast, the shear wave moves slow. So shear is dominated by the rotation problem. Turns out sure is the one that generates most of the injury. And the little movie you have on the right is one person, their brain, and you're looking at the brain stem, the ventricles, the white matter, the gray matter, the vasculature, the falx, the tentorium, the different parts of the anatomy of that one individual. So you can take humans and do non injurious experiments. You put them in an MRI, ask them to turn their heads, and Using dynamic MRI, you can image their brains and watch their brains move. And you can see the wave propagation in the brain if you look carefully. You see how the center of the brain is oscillating. That's shear wave propagation in the brain. And you can think, use that to try to understand how injury occurs. So we take humans, we go through anatomical imaging, so we can do MRIs basically to measure what the morphology and structure of the brain is. We then do MRI during a motion which is the biomechanical scan the bottom left. We build a subject specific model for the head. We then know what that particular subject subjected themselves to, and then we can compute how the deformation change will develop in the brain. And then by extrapolating that to a larger acceleration, we can compute when we're likely to get injured. And so one of the things you recognize there is that rotation dominates the problem. And so this is one of the interesting things. Some kinds of rotation are much worse for you than others. This is why boxers know what they're doing. If you constrain the motion of the head, you can really help people survive. That's the NASCAR story. There are some really good connections here that you can make between impact dynamics and big data on the neuroscience world. That's developing really rapidly. There's a really strong link. We should be able to make that. But you have to remember impact dynamics is fundamentally really short term. Humans, you're going to hope that they recover from this event, but they will recover over months and years. So you need some way of coupling those timescales together. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up with this one picture. So my view on things is if it's interesting, it must be dynamic. These are the kinds of things that I find really fascinating. So this is the 
asteroid Bennu. It was visited by the probe Osiris Rex over the last couple of years. Bennu is a few hundred meters in diameter. You can see it's kind of top shaped. That's because it's kind of a loose assembly of material. As you spin it, develops that central bulge. You can see it's got craters on it, so it's being impacted. It's a loose collection of material because it was collected together from fragments, from gravity. Those fragments were generated by impact. You've got big pieces of rock on it. Those rocks are going to continue to fragment. That process generates the dust that Kalyan was talking about, the zodiacal light, which you can go out and look at. This scale range is huge, but affects you from the level of your poetry down to the level of how you think. So I'm going to stop there. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ramesh, for a very engaging talk. I suggest, uh, you know, since there are right now 123 of us signed on, um, if uh, the the best way might be uh, to take questions is if you type them into the comment into the chat box. So please uh, type your uh, questions into the chat box, um, chatting to them to everybody, and I will read them off um, so that we can all hear them. So please go ahead. If you have a question. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see. With luck, I can see the speaker as well. Okay, you know. Okay. So I, I, I will ask a question just to get the ball rolling. So one of the uh, uh, topics that was uh, a recurring theme in your presentation was that shocks and dynamic deformation occur on a very wide range of scales from the small to the large. And I think that it's uh, you know not too much of a stretch for us to imagine that we can uh, perform experiments on the relatively smaller scales, although of course performing an experiment on the virus scale is a different matter. Um, but uh, what about those shocks that occur on the very, very large scale? For example, when you're studying the cr a crater on the moon, um, how, do you, how do you perform an experiment that informs you on, on how that uh, process is occurring? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the fundamental answer is uh, it's really hard to perform those kinds of experiments. It's not impossible. We have actually done them before. Do you remember the deep impact mission, which impacted a comet? That was an example of generating such a, an event. But it's really hard to make measurements, significant measurements during the event other than of the ejector. Um, there have been several um, uh, missions planned that would try to plant the equivalent of seismometers on a body or use laser ranging to see if you could see the shock propagate through. Uh, but the fact is for most of the bodies that we tend to look at, you know, asteroids, let's say, they tend to be very porous and wave propagation within the body tends to be really hard to see. So it's not likely that we'll be able to do those kinds of experiments at large scale anytime soon. But what we do instead is our experiments at smaller scale. You know, let's say a meter size scale is the largest that I've seen uh, that you would actually uh, have an impact event, something like that, and you can instrument those and develop fairly good uh, data sets. Otherwise, you're doing modeling. So these models are really important because you're going to use the model to help you scale. You don't have the ability to do the experiment that helps you scale. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, I'm going to read off a few other uh, questions that showed up in the chat box here. One from Tom Lacey here in uh, Texas A&M. What has been your most challenging dynamics problem? <laughs> oh, that's fun. Um, the, most of them are challenging. Actually, that's the fun part, right? Uh, but I would say the one that we've had the greatest, uh, uh, I've actually presented both extremes here. There are two of them that I find challenging for two very similar reasons. Uh, one is the asteroid problem. The other is the brain injury problem. And in both cases, the reason you're challenging is because we cannot perform the fundamental experiment. What you'd like to do in both cases is take the body, do the experiment, 
and measure on that body. In the case of the asteroid, we're getting there. So the dot mission, going to impact the asteroid Didymos B, uh, we should be able to perform the impact and there'll be a subsequent mission, the HERA mission from the European Space Agency that will come by and look at the, what's left over. There's an Italian mission, the Licia CubeSat that will see something during the impact. So we're beginning to do those experiments, but our problem with that is we don't know what the body is made of already, right? We don't know what the body is made of. We could do the experiment. So we have this couple of problems. We can see what's happening, but we don't quite know what we hit. We're going to interpret what we hit based on what we see. That's challenging for that reason. On the other hand, the brain injury problem, we cannot do the experiment on the human. We cannot take the human brain. Uh, I, I know people do it and they call it sports, but we don't do that from a controlled laboratory environment. What we can do is do those experiments on animal models, or we do it on mice, we do it on pigs, uh, but these are really difficult things to do. And you have a systems problem with the brain that makes it difficult to understand. Next question. Uh, YH000, could you please explain a little bit more about the effect of inertia, which you introduced in three different ways to understand the term dynamic? Sure, sure. So um, <clears throat> let me take uh, as a, an example the problem of voiding, of void growth. So let's imagine you take a piece of material and you subject it to dynamic hydrostatic tension. So you pull it apart, it apart rapidly. So it's a high tensile stress. At some point, it will nucleate voids, and the voids will begin to grow. The way the voids grow, if you think about it, is the voids are, are essentially creating open space inside your material, right? So around the void surface, if you think of it like a sphere, or you can think of it like your spherical shell problem, you're expanding the spherical shell, and what you get is a plastic zone around the, 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 the void surface. So there's a plastic zone that goes out from the void radius by some thickness. So for the void to go fast, you have to have that plastic zone go fast, which means you need the plasticity to be fast. The faster you try to drive the void, the faster you have to drive the plasticity. But the plasticity itself is limited by how fast the dislocations can move in your metal if you're doing this in a metal. And so it ends up that the faster you try to drive it, the more force it takes you to drive it. This is effectively like an inertia as far as the void is concerned. The void says, you try to drive me too fast, I'm going to resist that. That creates an effective inertia in the system. You see very similar things in fracture, right? And if you're trying to drive a crack too fast, the crack has a limiting speed really determined by things like the relay wave speed. As you try to drive faster than that, you have trouble getting the energy to the crack that fast enough. You'll get an effective inertia for your crack. So essentially, from a mechanics viewpoint, what's happening here is you're, you're changing the, your model so that you're only looking at the crack or the void. And you're trying to describe an effective equation for the crack or the void. You know, what is the, um, if you take the crack length as L, you look at L dot, L double dot, is there a limit on L double dot? You try to take the void size as A, you look at A dot, A double dot, is there a limit on A double dot? That's a sense of inertia. Essentially, there's a subscale model, whatever the fundamental deformation mechanism is, that tells you how the failure mechanism is going to be speed limited. That creates an effective inertia in the system. Next question, it comes from Max Powers at the University of Michigan. I know there are different deformation mechanisms at dynamic loading conditions for metals, for example, twinning, twip, trip, etc. Are there different deformation mechanisms for ceramics under dynamic loading conditions, or are they always brittle? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the answer is yes, there are, but in ceramics, the stress state matters a great deal. Um, so in ceramics, the deformation mechanism changes dramatically with the stress state and changes weakly with the strain rate. So if you apply a significant pressure, as you can imagine, it's going to be hard to drive cracks, right? So then the fracture mechanism will shut down and you'll get something else. Uh, in some ceramics, like silicon carbide, you'll get plasticity with dislocations. Uh, in other ceramics, like quartz or silicon, um, but think of it as ceramic, you're going to get uh, essentially amorphization the development of a glassy system. Um, so you can get other mechanisms that kick in. They tend to be dominated by the stress state. However, it's usually a stress and strain rate coupling. So 
uh, as the strain rate changes, you will change when the other mechanism kicks in to some degree. There's a different sense in which dynamics in terms of the rates affect ceramics too, which is the kind of cracking you get. So if you have fracture, uh, whether the cracks go through the grain boundaries or through the grains depends on the speed at which the crack is going. So the faster they're going, they're more likely to go through the grains, which is related to that inertia question we talked about a minute ago. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Next uh, question is also from Michigan, from Amit Misra. Great talk. Regarding the, the example of high-speed car crash, can you comment on materials design that minimizes damage to the vehicle and passengers? For example, are aluminum alloys better than steels? Hey, Amit. Nice to see you. So, um, yeah, sure, I can comment. The fact is that the materials design is not the dominant. It's structural design that dominates the car crash. So. Um, the, the material certainly couples into the structural design, right? So you, in general, you want something that uh, has sufficient plasticity so you can take some energy out, but designing the structure so you get crumple zones and so forth is more important than exactly which material you put in. If you really think about the structure, the dominant thing on the crash turns out to be, in addition to how you have collapse of structures, turns out to be the joints. The way in which the joints fail dominates the behavior. So this is usually the place where you have the most control as well, how you build the joints. Uh, you can think about this in terms of, you know, you, if you build a rigid car of high strength steel, strongly welded, it's not going to do very well in terms of protecting you. It will protect the car. You don't want to protect the car. You want to protect you. Next uh, question is from Jalen James uh, at Texas a and Is metallic or ceramic dynamic behavior more predictable than modeling tissue inside the body? If so, uh, why or why not? Yeah, I, I think well, you're sort of conflating two different issues. Uh, let me try to take them apart. Uh, so when you say is metallic or ceramic behavior more predictable, uh, the answer is yes, if you know what the material is. So if you understand the material microstructure, then yes, the material or ceramic and or metal or ceramic dynamic behavior is more predictable. That is, your models will be pretty good if you have a good hand idea of what the microstructure is. The trouble with tissue inside the body is um, it's hard to know what its structure is and how it's evolving and what has happened to it in the past. And that makes a difference to how it's going to behave. That's one. Another part is tissue inside the body is different from when you take the piece of tissue and take it outside the body. So if you take the brain, for example, right? I take a piece of the brain and I measure its properties in the lab. Uh, the properties are going to change as soon as I take it out. Uh, the chemistry is changing. As the chemistry is changing, the way the cells are responding is changing. Everything's being changed. So uh, it's much harder to say this is what the tissue is in the body. Um, it's also much more variable. So tissue in, you know, the three-year-old's brain is different from the tissue in the 75-year-old's brain. Thank you. Next question from uh, Emma Dickinson, University of Pittsburgh. How does dynamic behavior contribute to fatigue in a material? Yeah, this is kind of an interesting one. So fundamentally, Fatigue tends to be long-term, low stress. That's usually what you think about when you're talking about fatigue. Um, there are a couple of ways in which you can see dynamics coupling to fatigue. One case, which is really very important in the aerospace business, uh, is the idea that the dynamics generates the initial damage, which then propagates out through fatigue. So if you think about uh, you know, uh, turbine blades, right? and uh, you get uh, some kind of foreign object coming into your jet engine. Uh, so you've got um, a dust or a, you know, a, a nut from the, the runway that gets sucked into the engine. That generates a nick on the turbine blade and then that nick is now a notch and the notch propagates through a fatigue process. So you suddenly get that kind of process. So there, dynamics is showing up at the front end of the fatigue problem. Dynamics doesn't usually show up at the back end of the fatigue problem except in the sense that a pre-damaged system has a changed microstructure, and that microstructure then affects the fatigue. 
So you can see it in that sense. Fatigue is also very sensitive to the extremes of the distribution of the microstructure and the defect distribution of the microstructure. And so those extremes can be determined by a prior impact load. Um, now, now there's this mixed area where you get fatigue and somewhat high cycle fatigue, but at very high frequencies. And that's a tough game to play. I don't really understand it. So I'm not going to try to say too much there. Thank you. And our last question in the chat box right now is from Joe Calkins from uh, Carnegie Mellon. When you say designing the structure is more important in reference to car crashes, what does that mean? It, it, does that mean it is a wave propagation dominated dynamic event? Yeah, um, no, so it's not really wave propagation dominated in the uh, sense of waves in solids. It's in the sense of waves and structures. So yeah, I think I guess you could say that. Um, so in the structural collapse problem, what you've got is dynamic loading, and then a couple of different things happen. One is a uh, uh, consequence of the impact is you're going to excite certain modes in your structure, and which modes you excite determ are determined by the structural dynamics, almost a modal analysis problem from vibrations, if you like. But then you're going to drive those to a nonlinear domain. You're going to go really large in the stress level. That stress level is then going to lead to a collapse process. The collapse process is either a plastic collapse or some kind of a failure where things are beginning to come apart if there's a significant tension in there. So that's how they couple together. So there is wave propagation, but there's structural dynamics dominating, coupled into that. Okay, uh, there's uh, one more question also from Joe Calkins. Um, you listed many examples of dynamic events leading to failure and plastic deformation. Are there any elastic examples? Um, you're thinking of dynamic events where you think primarily of the elasticity. There are lots of examples of that where um, really we use this a lot in technology, right? So. Essentially, you can think about elastic waves that you use for wa as waveguides. Um, uh, a lot of what one does in uh, I don't know, surface acoustic wave devices, for instance, is using waveguides. Um, uh, you can think about the elastic wave as, and use that as the signature of some other event. So you do that for earthquakes, right? Your seismometers are measuring elastic waves uh, in the Earth's crust and then figuring out what happened during the earthquake. So there are examples. These are from a modeling viewpoint, from an understanding viewpoint, these are much easier to handle. It's basically a matter of doing a calculation with complex geometry, but elasticity is a fairly easy thing to work with. Next, we have uh, Yupeng Zhang from uh, Texas A&M. Do people use dynamic experiments to characterize material mechanical properties? I personally think the Young's modulus can be characterized more directly. How about plastic properties? What are the experiments commonly used to identify material properties in the community? Thank you. Sure. So, uh, yes, absolutely. People use dynamic experiments to characterize um, mechanical properties. Um, so conventionally, one would, one would think about elasticity as being rate independent. So you don't try to characterize things like the Young's model as using a dynamic experiment. Or at least there's no particularly good reason to do that. I mean, you can do things like ultrasonics and measure wave speeds, and the wave speed will give you the modulus. And, People do that for some systems. Uh, so resonant ultrasound spectroscopy can be really useful for composites and so forth. Uh, most of the uh, use, usefulness of dynamic experiments in terms of material behavior is to understand inelastic properties, plasticity, failure, other mechanisms like that. So plasticity is a very common one for which you try to measure the behavior. And the reason is that the plastic response of the metal depends on the strain rate. Or plastic response in most materials depends on strain rate. The faster you try to drive them, usually the stronger they are, but the way they're strong is very different. Um, so I, I didn't take enough time to do this, but if you think of uh, face centered cubic metals and body centered cubic metals, right? So you take the aluminums and the tantalums, so the aluminums and the, um, the, the uh, ions, right? Uh, they behave very differently. So the aluminums, for instance, the yield stress stays about the same, but the strain hardening changes with rate. The BCC metals, the tantalums and the ions, the strain hardening doesn't change with rate, but the yield stress changes with rate. Or the apparent yield stress changes with rate. So, big difference. And that's because of 
the way in which the deformation mechanism works inside them. And your question of what are the experiments commonly used to identify material properties in the community, you're going to see a lot of that during the rest of this course. Um, um, but uh, there's a fairly wide range of them. Um, so a very common technique is what's called the Kolsky bar. Some people call it the split Hopkinson pressure bar. Uh, that's very easy to use. Um, there are I, probably a thousand such installations in the world, maybe more, maybe a couple of thousand of those. Uh, we've got to the point that pretty much every institution is likely to have one, that kind of thing. Um, if you try to go to much higher strain rates, you begin to get a plate impact. Um, a little harder to do, smaller number of places that do it. Uh, and of course, if you do plate impact at very high velocities, you get shock waves. But then you have to interpret what your material behavior is by looking at the shock wave propagation, but you still can do that. And uh, the last question that we have right now in the chat box comes from Bruce Remington at uh, Lawrence Livermore. If you study hypervelocity impacts of dust in space on space hardware, what can be scaled to laboratory experiments and what cannot? Hi, Bruce. Good to see you. I can actually see your face. That's great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, this, this is a really good question. So, the scaling question is, is, is a useful one to think about. So, the way I think about this thing is, um, you know, there are uh, multiple scales to, to, to capture here. There is obviously the scale of the impactor, and then associated with that is the scale of your, your uh, uh, whatever um, damage you're going to generate. If you look at the scale of the impactor as compared to the scale of your microstructure, that tells you how you can scale the overall problem. So if the scale of your impactor is comparable to the scale of your microstructure, which is what often happens in the dust case, it's really hard to go from that to thinking about the case where the scale of your impactor is much larger than the scale of the microstructure. So that's, that's really the scaling, uh, one scale to think about. The other is to think of the shock thickness and how the shock thickness connects to the scale of the target material structure. Uh, usually in this case, when you go to, to large scale impacts, the shock thickness ends up being actually quite large. Uh, and so how you decide what your material behavior is inside that thickness can be difficult. And we actually got one more question here from Umair Benassim at uh, Texas A&M. You mentioned FCC and VCC metals under dynamic loading. Please comment on the HCP metals as well and how they are different from FCC and VCC. Yeah, thank you. Um, so HCP metals are different in a couple of very uh, important ways. One, uh, FCC and VCC face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic, both cubic, which means they're relatively high symmetry metals. Uh, uh, hexagonally close packed HCP metals are low symmetry metals. So typically that means they have a C axis along the C axis, the main axis of the crystal, they have one behavior, and in the basal plane, the A axis, you have a different behavior. So transversely isotropic might be as good as you get. Now, that's one thing. So the change in the symmetry means a lot of the plasticity mechanisms that you used to think about, classical plasticity, you really don't want to use for HCP. Second, because of the lack of symmetry, you get texture effects. That is, uh, if the grains are not perfectly randomly oriented, you will end up with your polycrystalline metal also having an isotropic. It's not just a single crystal that's anisotropic, your polycrystal is anisotropic because your grains are oriented in one particular way. And finally, HCP metals have an additional mechanism, which BC, FCC metals rarely show, FCC metals show uh, sometimes, and that's twinning. The development of twins inside your system, twinning reorients the crystal lattice, which means twinning can create an isotropy in the system. And so HCP metals actually have an evolving anisotropy during the formation. That evolving anisotropy means that you can get a very wide range of behaviors from a given piece of material. For instance, by changing the loading, I load it this way first, I get one behavior. Now I load it that way, I'm going to get a different behavior because I've changed my anisotropy in the system. So ATP metals are a lot more complicated because you've got to track twin evolution and texture evolution. Okay, we have a question here from Ethan, uh, maybe Ethan Sprague, I'm not sure, from Michigan. 
is the speed of the shock wave within a material related to the speed of impact, or is it a material property like the speed of sound, or is it a function of both? Yeah, this is one of those places where you say yes to everything. So, um, so, so think about the speed of sound, or, or let's say the, the elastic wave speed in a material, right? So certainly you would call that a material property. If you know the um, moduli and the density, you can calculate the elastic wave speeds. Um, and so that's a material property, that's a constant. So the elastic wave speeds don't care what the velocity of impact is so long as it's lower below a threshold. So everything stays elastic. Once the velocity of impact gets high enough, then the shock speed typically depends on the particle velocity generated by the impact. So you're going to get a shock speed that begins to change. However, the way it changes is a characteristic of your material. So the shock speed, that the way in which the shock speed depends on the particle velocity is a characteristic of your material. You could think of that as a material property, but it's one in a emergent property, if you like. It's a consequence of multiple things happening inside the material. In fact, a lot of people, when they talk about uh, characterization of materials, that's what they mean is shock characterization. They're measuring the shock wave speed as a function of particle velocity. So I will conclude now by just reading out a comment uh, from Ahmed Misra. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramesh, for an excellent kickoff lecture for the summer school covering, covering a broad range of applications of dynamic deformation. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, declare this lecture an, an unmitigated, su unmitigated success. The largest number of sign-ons at any given one time that I saw was 125. And of course, the number of individual sign-ons might have been even larger than that. We had uh, more than 24 minutes of questions for which we definitely thank uh, Professor Ramesh, this unprecedented access uh, for, to his time uh, for people from across the country and indeed across the world. Um, and I thank all of the participants uh, who uh, showed out and uh, came out and, and took advantage of this opportunity. Uh, I think this bodes well for the summer school. I hope to see you all again next week.